Okay. Scripture lesson is Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. That is Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. That is found in your pew Bibles on page 1827. That is page 1827. Once again, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. To the angel of the church in, in, uh, in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. And I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give your, you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the church. Those who are victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, there are many... Uh, there are many sources of trouble and pain and affliction in this world, and uh, I'm not going to name all of them, but I'm going to name a certain amount of them. The first time, the first thing we can think of so far as this world's concerned is that it's just the natural suffering of life that everybody endures. Uh, when we see certain things happen in the world, of course, we're shocked, just like if someone dies, we're shocked. But we know this is a reality of life. This is the natural evils that occur. And these are just things that happen no matter what it is, whether you're good, whether you're bad, whether you're neutral, it doesn't matter. These things are going to occur. And we're to expect that it's in the very fabric of this world that these things will occur. The second type is the one that we don't like to admit because it's one probably that we bring a lot of trouble onto ourselves, self-inflicted. You know, most people like to blame the devil, blame their parents, blame this, blame that. But the re reality is that they continue to make bad choices. People continue to make bad choices. They continue to suffer for them. And they wonder, why, God? Why are you making me suffer? Well, God's not making you choose those things. Those are things that come from our free will that we wanted to go. You, maybe you were even warned. <clears throat> your parents warned you. Your teacher warned you. Your pastor warned you. Everybody warned you. Don't do that. Don't go in that direction. Don't marry that guy. Don't marry this girl. Don't do this. Don't do that. And you did it nonetheless. And then you end up suffering. You go, oh, why? Why was I warned? Why didn't I have signs? Self-inflicted, we do this all the time. You know, Paul said, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. People reap what they sow. You know, that's just a reality in nature. That's a reality in life. You know, you sow to have oranges, you're going to get oranges, not apples. If you got apples, you know somebody was playing around with your, with your crop there because you're not supposed to. Uh, that's just life. And we have to be aware of that. The one that I want to talk about this morning is the one that comes across because we are being faithful to Christ. We are doing all the right things. We're being good people. We're doing exactly what Jesus wants to do, and yet we're being persecuted. Things are going wrong. Again, it's amazing that people would expect otherwise. I'm always amazed that when you follow a man who claimed to be God, who died on a cross, you expect to get flowers. I don't really get that. Jesus made it very clear. If this is the way they treat me, if this is the way they speak about me, what is it exactly that you're expecting? We should not expect any better. We should expect worse because we're following him. And this, this congregation was suffering severely for Jesus. And they were on the brink where they wanted to give up. And Jesus speaks to them, encouraging them, I know what you're going through. I know the horrors of, of what you're going through. But don't give up. Now this church, along with Philadelphia, are, are only one of the two churches here in the seven churches that nothing bad is said about them. You know, 
No scandal, no horror, no false teaching. On the contrary, complete faithfulness. And that's what we have to keep in mind. You know, we always think about, well, every church is like Corinth. Every church is like, no, no, no. There are good churches. And just like maybe, like in today, everything that goes on media is what? Things that are scandalous. You know, a pastor falls from grace. Oh, there's, you know, 400, 400 TV uh, channels focused on that. But another church is doing wondrous things in the community and doing great things, sacrifice themselves for the community. That No cameras there. They're not needed. Uh, that's the reality in the first century also. People always like to focus on the bad churches like Corinth rather than the great church of Smyrna. The fact is we don't know much about Smyrna. If it wasn't for the fact that it had a very famous bishop in the early centuries, uh, Polygarp, who was a great man of God. And again, if you, if you want to venture and read things outside the Bible that are biblical, uh, read Polycarp. He wrote a letter to Philippians. This is, this is a very godly man. I'm going to talk more about him when we get into the persecution that Smyrna went through. But first I wanted to look at um, what Jesus says to them, uh, how they have suffered for Jesus, and how Jesus understands and what it means. We read in verse 9, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. This is a great church. They're not perfect. It's not like they're sinless. It's not like, oh, wow, this is a sinless church. No, they're not perfect. Every church has problems. They have their issues. But they are maturing. They, are, they care about growing in Christ. And they are doing everything possible to be faithful to Jesus. But he knows three things about them. He knows their tribulation, their poverty, and the slander being spoken about them. Tribulation here, the Greek word, means trouble that afflicts, distress, oppression, affliction, tribulation. It is the idea of being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed until something's got to give. Uh, in the ancient world, they actually would use, you know, we talk about uh, horrible tortures. They would actually use boulders to slowly kill someone. And that was a form of torture. So it was slowly, now imagine that, or, you know, of course, the boulders also used to uh, do, the, do weed and to do uh, the grapes. Imagine that kind of boulder, that kind of squeezing, that kind of horror. So this is what this church is going through. They are going through severe persecution. Now, it's amazing that as Christians today, we may suffer about, simple, we may argue about different things, you know, complain about different things and say, oh, I got a toothache. Oh, I got a headache. Oh, how I'm suffering for Jesus. Oh, this headache won't go away. You know, oh, my goodness, this church has no air conditioning. You're kidding me. Oh, my goodness, all the suffering I got to endure for, we do have air conditioning. Oh, no, oh, all the suffering I have to endure for Jesus, you know. But that's how we know, we, we talk about these little things. These people were suffering. They were suffering. They were losing everything. You know, Richard Buckman st states, it is the worldwide preaching of the gospel which involves the church in worldwide persecution. If you're going to preach Jesus, don't expect flowers. Don't expect compliments. You are, you are preaching light. You're preaching, you're saying people are sinners. They need God. Once you tell people they're sinners, you're, you're already, you're, you're in a, they're going to get in a bad mood. They don't want to be told they're sinners. They want to be able to get away from all that. But Jesus says, I'm with you. I suffer with you. I go through this with you. But they are suffering for Christ. They are suffering severely for the Lord. Um, and they're also poor. Now, in the ancient world, in, in ancient Greek, there are two words for poverty. One is means you have barely enough to get by. The other one is you're dead poor. You got nada. Like I heard this little kid on, uh, on YouTube, it was hilarious. You know, they're doing a math problem. He says, you know, little boys, they tell the math problem. Uh, Johnny has $1, uh, he has a quarter, and he has two pennies. How much does he have? And the little boys say, he poor. <laughs> he poor. <laughs> Johnny poor. And I was like, yeah, but he knows his math. Kid's got nothing. It's no money. Well, these guys were poor. And, of course, that came from the persecution that they were going through. You know, today, where would such a church stand today? In an era where people are preaching prosperity and health and all these wondrous things, here's this faithful church which Jesus commends, and they don't have any of that. You know, on the contrary, we are told they are rich, and we're going to get to that. But not in the way we think of it. Not in the way our society thinks of it. This church, you're never going to hear a sermon by prosperity preachers on this church. And yet they are faithful to the Lord. They have lost everything. They're being persecuted. Um, and by people who say that they are religious, those who call themselves Jews, 
but really our synagogue of Satan. They're blaspheming. They're destroying these people's lives. And like I mentioned last week, when you, in the ancient world, when you were taken to court and you were awaiting a trial, whatever, if you had to leave your house for any reason, good luck. You know, the state might take over it. The people might loot it. By the time you got back, literally, you might have nothing. And then you were dependent on other people completely. And that's where the church stepped in. The church was the charity. And if you look at our society, before we had welfare, before we had all these things, it was the church. The church was the one providing for those in the community, taking care of the people. And slowly the state took over. But it was the church. And back then, there was no social security. There was no welfare. There's not. The church stepped in to help these believers and to help any believer that was going through a hard time, make sure that they would survive, that they would make it. But they were suffering severely. And Jesus says, these people who are persecuting you, they're not the people of God. You cannot slander others. You cannot be speaking ill about other people. You cannot be hurting them, trying to destroy them, and imagine that you're a Christian or that you're good. No, you're not. When you're trying to harm someone and destroy them, destroy their business, destroy their livelihood, you're not a good person. You're wicked. And these people were wicked, yet despite all that, they're, they're claiming to have the upper hand and they're, they're religious. And, and God says, no, you're not. You're not the people of God. The people of God are those who are suffering, those who are enduring all these, who are faithful. But here's the interesting thing about this passage. That after telling them, you have tribulation, you have poverty, you have these people slandering, now the bad news. What? <laughs> what? Did you catch that? Now the bad news. It reminds me of this, this movie I saw. I can't remember her name. The lady was hilarious. She was going through all kinds of disasters. Everything was going bad for her. Just horrible, horrible, horrible. Uh, and she's sitting there talking to her mom. I just, mom, everything's so bad. Everything's so horrible. And her, mom's, her mom looks at her and said, but honey, at least you haven't hit rock bottom. And you just seen her face. What? <laughs> you mean there's more? <laughs> there's more? And I, I, I laughed. I couldn't get it at first. Why her face had changed so horribly? But she had done the math. You mean I've gone through all this and there's still more where I can go down? Oh, no, God, please, no. And that's exactly what they're being told. They're being told, verse 10, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Wow. All that they're going through and says, it's not over. It's not over. Here's the heads up. It's coming. And they did. They suffered heavy persecution. One of them being their bishop, Polygarp, later on in the century, who served the Lord faithfully, a great man of God. And all he had to do, all they had to do was say, I honor Caesar, or to burn a little incense for Caesar. But they would not, because then they were saying that Caesar is God, and Jesus is not God. And Caesar is Lord, and Jesus is not Lord. And they would not do that. And they told Polygarp, who was already a, a, an old man who was 86 years old, to do this. And I love the way he replied it. His words have been kept in record for us. It's beautiful. It says, 80 and 6 years have I served Christ, and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Wow. That is faithfulness. That is the service of the people of Smyrna. That, that's, he is the... Bishop, ex, you know, example to follow for everybody because here's a man who was faithful and his congregation was just like that as well. They were willing to die for Christ. They knew that Christ had been faithful. Jesus died for me. He gave his life for me. What is it for me then to give my life for him? Or maybe I won't have to give my life. Maybe something else. But what is it? Nothing compared to that. You know, Leonard Ravenhill once said, when God opens the windows of heaven to bless you, the devil will open the doors of hell to blast you. Always be ready that if you really are decided to follow Jesus, people will say, oh yeah, follow Jesus, great, it's wonderful. Just be ready. Be ready. The enemy doesn't like that. We have enemies. We have people that are enemies of the cross, who hate the things of Christ. And when they see you being kind, being wonderful, being faithful, serving the Lord, they're going to try and make your life a living hell. And how many people have gone through that? They have tried to serve the Lord. And the more they try to serve the Lord, it seems like things are getting worse. And again, the, the, the temptation is to give up. And that's why this message is so important for us as believers, that when we're going through these things, don't give up. Don't give up. Fight through it. Persevere. Keep going and going. And Jesus tells them, I know your afflictions. I know your poverty. 
but you are rich. And of course, right there, the irony of that, wait a minute, how can they be rich? They're dead poor. They have nothing. Well, because he's not judging them according to the values of American society or Roman society or any other society, but the values of God. When we imagine wealth, we always imagine fame, success, money, all these things, you know. But when God looks at success, he imagines someone who is righteous, someone who is faithful, someone who is holy, someone who is kind, someone who is generous. It's a completely different set of values. The values of this world are based upon gain and having more and more and more. And yet, of course, we know the reality that no matter how rich you are, you will die. No matter how rich you are, you will not be exempt from disease and problems. Just look at famous people. And just because you're rich doesn't mean that you're not going to end up with addictions. Look at all the rich people. These things happen. Horrible things are going to be happening. But we have to be faithful to the Lord and not judge according to the values of our world. You know, there was a preacher sitting in a diner and he heard uh, two men who were sitting there who had graduated from Princeton. They were talking about, you know, how well successfully they were doing. They, were, they started talking about their classmate who had not done so well successfully. Ironically, a pastor knew who this man was. And this man was faithful to his family, hardworking man, you know, doing a lot of things in the community. But he had sacrificed certain things so that he could be there for his family. He could be there for the community. And yet for them, he was unsuccessful. They saw themselves as wealthy, successful, and now he is a failure. But it's all backwards. It's the other way around. You know, Jesus said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You know, how do we measure success? How do we measure what is success, what is being rich, what is uh, ha having, having made it in this world, in this life? And unfortunately, the bad thing is, not only is the world like this, but the church has been contaminated by this. Many times the church will give lip service. Oh yes, we love humility, we love kindness, we love poverty, everyone should be a missionary, blah, 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 blah. But look at the way they speak to each other when no one has a microphone near them, when no, one's, no one can hear what they're saying, when they're talking to their children. What are they trying to enforce upon their children? You know, be successful, you know, go do this, yeah, so you can be successful, be a doctor, be a lawyer, you know. And yet when they're in church, oh yeah, missionaries are wonderful, they're great. But if their child decides to become a missionary, they'll probably, you know, <laughs> undo the world just to make sure, no, son, you don't want to do that. No, my daughter, you don't want to do that. You want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer. How do we measure success? Let me say this much. For our children, we should want, first of all, first of all, that they will know Jesus. Amen. That they will know and love Jesus all the days of their lives. Amen. That is the most important thing. Secondly, whatever career they choose, that they would enjoy it. That they would have fun. It's how horrible to see people pick so many careers up because, because of the money or whatever. And they're miserable. They're not happy doing what they're doing. You know, my wife is like, of course, the old school, you know, Chinese, you know, da, da, da. And I'm like Cuban. I've learned my ways. No way, man. This is not, this stuff doesn't work for me. I, I don't see the logic in any, any of the stuff in the world. I've, I've been around too long to believe in any of this nonsense. So I tell my daughter, first of all, of course, Christ above all. But second, I tell her, find something that you enjoy doing. Something that you'll be happy doing. That you're going to want to get up every single day to do it because you love it. It's a wonderful profession. You enjoy that stuff. You know, and... In the midst of all that, if they get rich, great. Praise God. We're not against riches. Don't think that I'm against money. If you have money, praise God. If you have riches, praise God. Good. The Lord bless you that way. But then what that means is that your Christianity will then enforce itself upon your money. That you will see your money as a means to help other people. Look at disaster going on over there in the middle, in the middle of our country, right? Where's Hollywood? Not many people in Hollywood have stood up. All of a sudden you hear Dolly Parton gives a million dollars. There's a woman with good background, a good Christian woman who's had good bringing, who cares about people, who cares. And now if she didn't have that character, what would the money mean? Nothing. It means that she'll have money for herself, like, a, like you know, Daffy Duck. Mine, 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 all mine. That's all they care about. But you see, Hollywood is, is funny because to me, I, I've never gotten over the fact, even years ago when I was young, even as a kid, I was like, what? You know, they, you shouldn't think too much if you want to stay sane in this world. Um, I would, I, you know, I see these programs on TV where, you know, famous movie stars would be there telling me to send $10 to, 
and they have millions of dollars. I got a problem here. Am I allowed to ask questions? Because <laughs> I thought that was so weird. But when you see people who have all this money, and in a moment like this, when they see a tragedy like this, they extend themselves. You're like, there it is. That's what you want for your child. You want your child to be a Christian, to enjoy what they're doing, enjoy life. And then when they see the need, when they see their neighbors suffering, to see that suffering as their suffering and to be a Christian and to reach out and help them. That is the most important thing. Jesus said in verse 10, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you, uh, give you life as your, as your, as your victor's crown. Notice, notice he says be faithful. He doesn't say be successful and you will get these things. He doesn't say be brilliant and you will get these things. We're always pushing the wrong thing. Be faithful. You know, maybe not all of us can be successful in worldly terms. Maybe not all of us can be brilliant in worldly terms, but we can be faithful. And that's what he's asking of us. And he said, if you're faithful, I will give you the crown. Now, back in the ancient world, when they ran races, of course, they got this little uh, makeshift crown that they wore, but he's going to give them the crown of life to enjoy all the things that he has. They need to persevere. They need to keep going. They need to be faithful all the way to the end. Uh, la suffering will not last forever. You know, Paul made it very clear. He said, you know, yes, you can torch me, whatever, but eventually I'm going to die. And then I'll be in glory. And nothing can compare to that. Therefore, we do not lose heart, he says. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We put our eyes upon Christ. We run the race. We're faithful. Yes, you may be suffering. And it had nothing to do with you. It's not because you were you, you afflicted upon yourself. It's not just one of those natural things. You're suffering because you're being faithful to Jesus. And Jesus speaks a word to you this morning. He says, persevere. Remain faithful. And I will give you the reward. You are rich. You're not poor. Continue, continue, continue. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for this word that encourages us, Lord, that no matter what we're going through, certainly there are things that we go through because it's part of our life, other things because we are stupid and we do stupid things and end up being hurt. But there are things that we are suffering because we're seeking to be faithful to you. And it may have hurt our jobs, may have hurt our relationships, may have hurt something else, Lord. But thank you, Lord, that you're encouraging us this morning, telling us, don't give up. Continue in the path that you're going. Persevere despite the pressure that you're going through and that you would bless us because of it. We thank you. We praise you. We ask, Lord, that you now guide us as we come to your table. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
Yet for us, he became poor, says the scriptures. In line with what I was preaching, I remember years ago I heard a, a prosperity preacher talking about all the rich people, how God always blesses and we're all rich, 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 rich. And he's going through a list of people, Solomon, Moses, all those people. I'm waiting for him to get to Jesus. You know, he got to Jesus. And you know what he says? That Jesus became poor so that we could become rich. I said, wow. Oh. Really? Is that what Jesus died? So I could have a nice Cadillac? So I could have a, a beautiful mansion? Is that why he died? No. He died so I could have everlasting life. So I could be released from the pain and horror uh, that is hell. From being lost and having no purpose in this world. To have peace, to have joy. That's why he died. He was in heaven. He had everything. And indeed, he gave up everything so that you could share communion with him. And this is what we remember here, that he gave his body, he gave his blood, so that we could be one with him. So that when we come to that moment of facing death, we will face death, but we won't face it alone. And we'll be, then we will be guided into his presence to be eternally with him. That is the glory that awaits us. As we come to this table, always a reminder, that if there's anything between you and God or you between another person, something, some sort of animosity, something hatred, something that in any way would stop you from partaking of this table, don't partake of it. There's no shame in that. Uh, it is better not to partake of it than to partake of it without thinking about what it means, about the weight of what this entails, that we're partaking in the body of Christ. And should, we should be right with God if we're going to do that. Um, before we do, Bow your heads, close your eyes, and if anything to say to the Lord before we take partake of this, this is the time to do so. Before we partake of the bread, I'd like to ask our brother Adrien to lead us in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this time together in fellowship. In fellowship of you, Lord, is because of your ultimate sacrifice on the cross for our sins, Lord, that uh, we can go to you, Lord. And what, what pops to heart and, and mind, Lord, is the fact that we can pray, and we can pray at any time, at any moment, and we can share everything of who we are, Lord, all of our vulnerabilities, all of our uh, insecurities, all of our hopes, our dreams, uh, our anger, our frustration. We can share everything of who we are in prayer, Lord. Uh, for those who trust and love you, Lord, we, I just pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that because uh, of your death on the cross, Lord, you, you wanted to, to share that, that relationship, that close relationship with us, Lord. So I pray for everyone here, Lord, that uh, we enter, we honor you, we honor your sacrifice on the cross by, by daily going into intimate prayer, Lord, and talking to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your love, for your promises, for your sacrifice, and in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. Once he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Let us take and eat the body of Christ. Before we partake of the cup, I'd like to ask our brother Victor to lead us in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this occasion. Let us remember that uh, Jesus liberated the Hebrews from the slavery in Egypt. In the same way, he has liberated us from the slavery of uh, sin. Amen. And even though we do fall sometimes, let us remember that we are not dominated by sin. Let us all to always remember that and think of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the same manner, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he said, This is the blood of the new covenant that I make with you, the blood that is shed for the remission of the sins of many. Let us take and drink the blood of Christ. Amen. As we conclude, let us stand and sing our final hymn.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the peace and fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with us until we meet again. Amen. Amen.